say Order, we Senator haven't Lyons. done enough. It being 2 p.m., questions, Senator Gallagher. Thank you very much, Mr. President. My question is to the minister representing the Minister for Health, Senator Colbeck. Can the minister confirm the Morrison government placed its first order of Moderna in May, nine months after the Trump administration had placed its Moderna orders? The minister representing the Minister for Health, Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Mr. President. I don't have the specific date when the first order of Moderna was placed, Mr. President, but the, what the Australian government has done is go through a process of full recognition and registration of all of the vaccines that we have utilised in the country, Mr. President. We've had the opportunity to take advantage of the international experience with respect to the utilisation of or the uh, Senator Colbeck, I have vaccines, Senator Gallagher Mr. on a point of order. Senator Sorry, Gallagher. Thank you, Mr. President. Point of order, uh, direct relevance. We were not asking about the registration, provisional or otherwise, by the TGA. We were asking about the original order of Moderna, the actual vaccine procurement strategy. On, on the point of order, um, you reminded the minister of the question. The minister addressed part of the question in his initial response, but given that you've called for the remaining information to be directly relevant, I'm going to ask the minister, I believe information about ordering vaccines in that case would be directly relevant because he's directly addressed the first point you asked rather than a broader comment on vaccine strategy. I'll let you remind him of it. I'll listen to his answer carefully. Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Mr. President. Mr. President, uh, the Moderna vaccine forms a very important of the overall vaccine strategy for this country. Uh, as I said to the chamber a moment ago, I don't have the specific date with me that the first order was placed. I'm happy to take that on notice and confirm that for the chamber, Mr. President. Um, uh, but uh, it forms a very important part of the overall vaccine strategy and the, and the way that this government has managed the introduction of new vaccines into the country has to be in, to, as to, in, to ensure that we've had full data available to the country via the TGA to ensure that the vaccines that we're utilising have high levels of efficacy and are safe, Mr. President. Mr. President, we, through the TGA, took just 23 days to approve the utilisation of the Moderna vaccine, Mr. President. So we have used all our, all our resources to ensure that we could have access to this vaccine as quickly as it was safely possible so that it could be incorporated into the vaccine rollout program. Senator Gallagher, a supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. President. Moderna has been administered in the United States since December last year in France, Germany and Italy since January this year, in Singapore since March, in the UK and Canada since April and in Japan since May. Can the minister confirm that as late as April this year, the Morrison government still hadn't even commenced discussions with Moderna to secure vaccine supplies? Order. Senator Colbeck. Mr President, we have at all times worked with Vaccine, vaccine suppliers across the globe to ensure that we have capacity to meet the demands of the vaccination rollout for, for the Australian people, Mr. President. As I've just indicated to you, uh, we approved the data set for the Moderna vaccine in 23 days, uh, Mr. President. Uh, we took the approach all through the rollout of this vaccine that we would utilise vaccines that were fully approved by the TGA. Uh, and assessed through a TAGI to, so that we could guarantee to the Australian people that they were getting access to an efficacious and a safe vaccine, Mr President. Uh, we saw that as importance for vaccine confidence in the Australian community, Mr President. So we have taken every step to ensure that Australians could be confident in the vaccines that they were taking and they went through the full and proper approval process. Senator Gallagher, a final supplementary question. Thank you, Mr President. More than six million people are in lockdown in New South Wales and unable to get vaccinated as a result of the Morrison government's repeated failure to secure enough vaccine supplies. Aren't these Australians paying the price for Mr Morrison's repeated insistence that it isn't a race and that it isn't not a competition? Senator Colbeck. 
Well, Mr. President, I won't apologise for ensuring that the vaccines that are available to Australians have been through a full and proper Order. assessment and approval process, Mr. President. I won't ap apologise for that, Order. and nor will the government, Mr. President. It is important, Mr. President, from uh, to ensure that there is vaccine confidence within the Australian community that we have taken the approach that we have. Australians can be confident that the vaccines that are approved for use here in Australia have been fully approved by the TGA, Mr President, that they have the confidence of the TGA and ATAGI and that Australians can be confident in taking up the vaccines that have been approved for the vaccine rollout in Australia. It's the Labor Party, Mr President, who continue to undermine the confidence of Australians with their negative attitude and negative tactics attacking the vaccine rollout, Mr President. Mr President, the Labor Order. Party should be ashamed for their approach to the I'm, vaccine rollout. Well, I'm going to remind senators that when I'm hearing from people remotely, there needs to be extra compliance with the standing orders so I can hear the contributions. Order. Senator Small. Thank you, Mr President. My question is to a fellow Western Australian and the Minister representing the Minister for Employment, Workforce, Skills, Small and Family Business, Senator Cash. Yeah. Can the Minister advise the Senate how this government's plan is delivering an economic framework to help small and family businesses grow, prosper and create jobs as we chart our way out of the COVID-19 pandemic? Minister representing the Minister for Employment, Workforce, Skills, Small and Family Business, Senator Cash. Thank you, Mr President, and I thank Senator Small for the question uh, and acknowledge, obviously, that as a small business owner, Senator Small, like those of us on the government side of the chamber, knows that governments put in place economic frameworks that can assist business in prospering and growing and creating more jobs for Australians. Uh, and certainly, Senator Small has been successful in employing a number of Australians back at home in Western Australia. Mr President, in terms of the economic framework to assist businesses to prosper, to grow and to create more jobs, that is exactly how the Morrison government approached the recent 2021-22 budget, with the Minister for Finance the Treasurer and the Prime Minister delivering a budget that puts in place those policies that well and truly back Australia's 3.5 million small and family businesses. Our economic measures are all about giving businesses the confidence to invest, to take on a new staff member, but also to get back to doing what they do best if they've been affected by COVID-19. Mr President, we're investing $7.2 million to improve and maintain a new employment tour contract, making it easier for small businesses to take on that new staff member, but at the same time to meet all of their obligations. We're also expanding the digital solutions with an investment of $12.7 million, which will support an additional 10,000 businesses to improve their digital capability and further encourage uptake of digital technology in small businesses. Because what has COVID-19 in particular taught us, Mr President, and that is businesses do need to have that digital capability. And of course, on the government side of the chamber, we understand that red tape it strangles business. And that's why we are continuing to back in our deregulation agenda with $134.6 million being invested to make measures easier, to make it easier to employ people and reduce the regulatory burden for businesses of interacting with the government. Senator Small, a supplementary question. Thank you, Mr President. Minister, how is this government helping those Australian people who get out and have a go to keep more of what they earn. Senator Cash. Well, Mr President, the 2021-22 budget is continuing to support businesses to keep more of what they earn through measures that we are implementing, such as the temporary full expensing and the lost carryback arrangements. We're delivering a further $20.7 billion in tax relief to Australian businesses that back themselves and invest in their future. Mr President, what we also know is that the initial round of business tax incentives, they have been highly effective. Machinery and equipment investment has been growing at its fastest rate in seven years. So what you see is businesses who have that capacity are out there and they're utilising the policies that the government is putting in place to back themselves and to invest back into their business. This means that the local cafe, the local construction company and even the local plumber, they've been able to utilise the policies that the Morrison government has put in place to reinvest in themselves and, again, 
prosper, grow, and what we're all about, creating more jobs Order. for Senator Australians. Cash. Senator Small, a final supplementary question. Thank you, Mr President. Minister, how are these measures important in supporting Australian businesses, particularly in the context of the risks that those businesses face as we chart Australia's economic recovery? Senator Cash. Well, Mr President, the Morrison government's plan to secure Australia's recovery of course means keeping taxes low. On the Morrison government side of the chamber, it's in our DNA lowering taxes. And certainly when you look at the estimated $320 billion worth of investment that is expected to be supported by our business tax incentives and create 60,000 jobs by the end of 2022-2023, we understand in particular by keeping taxes low and helping businesses keep more of what they earn, after all, that is their money, they've earned their money, we can continue to secure our economic recovery into the future. But, Mr President, I think one of the key contrasts, the key contrast between the Liberal Nationals government and those on the Labor side is obviously when it comes to lower taxes, because we did not take as an election policy to the last election $387 billion in higher taxes. That's the gift. That's the gift that the Labor Party would have given the Australian people. $387 billion Order, in higher Senator taxes. Cash. Senator Wong. Thank you. Mr President, my question is to the Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Birmingham. Before the horror 2019-2020 bushfire season, Mr Morrison ignored warnings from experts and from former fire chiefs that Australia was unprepared for the dangers. Overnight, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change has warned, and I quote, the intensity, frequency and duration of fire weather events are projected to increase throughout Australia. I ask, will Mr Morrison ignore this warning too? The Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Birmingham. Thanks, sir. Thanks, Mr President. Well, Mr President, the Prime Minister has already publicly responded to the release of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change's sixth report. Uh, the Prime Minister has, uh, has acknowledged the importance of this report, uh, the importance of the report in continuing to inform Australia's effort in delivering emissions reductions, our successful efforts as a nation in delivering emissions reductions, and the importance of unified global action in this regard in dealing with emissions. The government, Mr President, looks forward to the opportunities that will be provided by the Conference of the Parties at Glasgow later this year to discuss the type of progress that is being made in Australia and around the world and the commitments for the future. We look forward to the fact that we can talk about Australia's emissions reduction, some 20 per cent emission reduction since 2005. Now, I, hear, I hear the interjection from opposite saying how embarrassing. Well, by comparison, Mr President, our 20 per cent stands alongside a 1 per cent reduction in Canada, a 10 per cent reduction in Japan, a 4 per cent reduction in New Zealand or a 13 per cent reduction in the United States. I make those comparisons not to criticise any of those nations, Mr President, but to highlight Order. in fact those opposite, those opposite and those who in the debate in Australia seek to paint a proposition that Australia somehow does not achieve emissions reductions, whereas in fact our country has. Our country has in part, of course, by the motivation of the Australian people as well, Mr President. One in four Australian households have rooftop solar, the highest rate of uptake in the world. Last year, Australia saw some seven gigawatts of renewable energy capacity installed in our country, nearly eight times faster than the global average per person. It is this momentum that we intend to continue to pursue, and it is absolutely our commitment to make sure we continue to meet and beat those targets in the future. Senator Wong, a supplementary question. The former Cabinet Minister and Coalition Senator, Senator Canavan, has described the IPCC as, and I quote, a dodgy PR firm rather than a scientific body. And he has also asserted that the IPCC have and I quote, no scientific credibility. Wow. Does Mr Morrison agree with Senator Canavan? Senator Birmingham. Thanks, Mr President. And the answer to that is, uh, is no. As I said in the primary answer, the Prime Minister has already responded to the IPCC report in a press conference earlier today. Uh, and as I outlined, and the government takes seriously the challenges of addressing global climate change. We take it seriously, Mr President. As a government, and it's why we're investing some $20 billion on low emissions technologies 
over the next decade, some $1.6 billion committed just through this 21-22 budget. It's why, in the Prime Minister's recent visit overseas, he signed partnership agreements that now see us in partnership arrangements with Singapore, Japan, Germany and the United Kingdom to deliver the low emissions technologies that the globe needs to be able to deliver and achieve net zero emissions. The 21-22 budget particularly dedicated $565 million to progress international research projects, knowing that those international projects of cooperation are the things that will actually deliver the technological changes Order, to get Senator the job Birmingham. done. Senator, Senator Wong, a final supplementary question. Right. Senator Rennick yes. has declared, and I quote, climate change hysteria is a cancer that must be destroyed. And I take his interjection, yep, uh, is a cancer that must be destroyed. And Senator Rennick has also accused Australia's Bureau of Meteorology of tampering with data. Yep, Order. and I take the interjection again. He says yep. Will Senator Mr Morrison Rennick. continue to capitulate to the extremes of the coalition party room or Order. will he commit to net Senator zero Wong, by 2050? The question. Senator Rennick, Senator Rennick, Interjections, particularly during questions, are inappropriate. Senator, Senator Wong, Senator Wong, I'm calling the Senate to order. Senator Birmingham. Thanks, sir. Thanks, Mr. President. What the Prime Minister will do, what the government will do, is to continue to get on with implementing our policies that are making a difference in terms of reducing Australia's emissions. What the Prime Minister and the government will do, which is what you asked me, Senator Wong, is that we will make sure we continue to pursue the policies that are achieving the downwards trajectory in Australia's emissions, that we invest in the technologies that are necessary. Our technology investment roadmap with its stretch targets Order. to make clean hydrogen affordable, not just for Australia, but around the world. Senators to make energy Watt storage Rennick. affordable, not just in Australia, but around the world. Senator to Watt. make carbon capture and storage affordable, not Senator. just in Australia, but around the world. To make Senator low carbon Wong. steel, low carbon aluminium a reality, not just in Australia, but around Order. the world. To make effective soil Senator carbon Watt. a reality, a not just times. in Australia, but around the world. I make those points, it has to be achieved around the world, Mr President. That's why we need the technology breakthroughs, because then not only can Australia reduce its emissions, but so too can other countries, particularly developing countries, through those tech breakthroughs. Order. Again, I'm going to ask senators, wearing masks, it is hard to tell who is breaching standing orders by interjecting. So apologies if I occasionally get it wrong. Senator McKim. Thank you, President. My question is to the Minister representing the Minister for the Environment, Senator Hume. Minister, does the Minister for the Environment owe Australia's children a duty of care to provide them with a safe climate into the future? The Minister representing the Minister for the Environment, Senator Hume. I assume that this is the same message that the criminals this morning painted all over the front of Parliament House. Painted order, all over. Order. Senator Hume, um, I won't anticipate Senator McKim, but I'll call you to make your point of order. Thank you, President. And if, if you had anticipated that my point of order would be on relevance, you would be entirely accurate. This was an extremely narrowly scoped question. And it didn't go to the brave protesters Order, raising Senator really McKim. important climate Senator issues McKim. at the front of Parliament House this Order. morning. Given the damage done to the building, Senator McKim, I'll assume you're talking about a protest rather than an illegal act. Senator Hume, um, Senator McKim, while you, you were only speaking for seven seconds, I'm reluctant to call a minister before the first full stop in their answer, but you've reminded the minister. I call Senator Hume to continue. Thank you, Mr President. I don't think that the, the Environment Minister would make any apology for defending this government, the Australian people, against climate vandals, which are the people that deface government property Order. this morning. Senator McKim. So you have to Senator call Hume. heroes. Senator Hume. I'm going to ask you to turn to the Minister, Senator McKim's question. Um, I'm not going to instruct you how to answer it, um, but he has reminded you of it. Senator Hume. 
Oh, thank you again, Mr. President. But I tell you, I'm unclear as exactly what Senator McKim's question is. Does the, does the Environment Minister owe? On, on, on a point of order, Senator McKim, this is it's question time is not meant to be interactive. I'm, I'm going to, <laughs> unless you're raising a point of order on relevance. Well, I am raising a point of order on relevance, Chair. So this is the third attempt that the minister has made, and uh, on none of those attempts has she come anywhere well, near addressing first, a very simple on question. On Senator McKim, on the, first, on the first point of order, when the minister is speaking for seven seconds, I'm, I'm not going to rule a minister not being relevant at that point, because I haven't had an opportunity to hear what they're going to say. Um, Senator Hume to continue. Thank you again, Mr. President. I think I now understand what it is that, Ms. that Senator McKim is trying to get to. It's nothing to do with the climate, the climate criminals that painted slogans all over the Parliament House this morning. It's nothing to do with the climate criminals that painted slogans all over the lodge this morning. It's nothing to do with the climate criminals. This is my Senator, understanding, Senator, Mr. President. Senator, Senator Hume. Senator McKim, on your point of order, I'm assuming you're going to make it on direct relevance. Well, well I am, Chair, yeah. and I just want to make the point the, the submission to you that Senator Hume is coming perilously close to disrespecting your rulings. When it comes to interjections across the chamber, I think there are dozens of senators that disrespect my rulings. Um, Senator Hume, I am going to ask you to turn to the question asked by Senator McKim rather than repeat um, how, what, what the question might not be. Senator Hume. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. So I am assuming, Senator McKim, that what it is that you're trying to refer to is the case that is currently before the courts, the Sharma and Oars versus the Environment Minister case. Is that correct, Senator McKim? Thank you very much. That the minister has a duty of care to young people regarding climate change. So, Mr. President, on the 27th of May 2021, the federal court delivered a judgment declining to grant an injunction preventing the Minister for Environment from approving the Vickery extension project. On the 8th of July 2021, the Federal Court made final orders and provided further reasons in the matter. The order. Court declared Senator that the Minister McKim of the Environment owed Senator Hume, I have Ke Senator McKim on a point of order. Senator McKim. Uh, thank, thank you, President. The, 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 the point of order is again on relevance. I, I make the point that my question did not reference uh, the case that Minister Hume is referring to. We are now uh, three quarters of the way through the time allotted. The question is very simple. Does the Minister for Environment Sorry, Senator, owe Australia's Senator children McKim, a duty I'll, of I'll care? I'll take Senator Birmingham before I rule on the point of order. Senator Birmingham. Do, 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 just on the point of order, Mr President, and whilst interjections are, uh, are of course always disorderly, sometimes they can help to clarify matters in the chamber. And I distinctly heard uh, when Senator Hume um, started to reference the case and posed it in the question of, I assume this case is what the question is referring to. I heard cries of yes coming from the Australian Greens corner. So I fail to see how Senator McKim can now suggest that Senator Hume is somehow not being directly relevant to the question he asked, of which it sounds like he and his team confirmed she was being directly re relevant. Order. There are definitely, on the point of order, I, I, I'm sorry, I can't take points of order remotely under the provisions for remote participation. I think, is that you, Senator Thorpe? My apologies. Um, on the point of order, when Senator Hume did reference that case, I definitely did hear see nods and hear acknowledgements of finally from part of the chamber. That happens to be down your end, Senator McKim. You are asking me, however, I think given that this matter is in the public domain, um, I can't instruct a minister how to answer the question, and I believe in this sense she is being directly relevant by turning to this particular issue. There's an opportunity to debate the question answer after question time, but she is being directly relevant. Senator Hume. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. So the court, Senator McKim, uh, the court declared that the Minister for the Environment owed a duty, of ca uh, duty to take reasonable care to avoid causing personal industry or death to young people in Australia, arising from emissions of carbon dioxide to the Earth's atmosphere and determining the Vickery Extension Project. But on the 16th of July 2021, the Minister for the Environment filed a notice of appeal and is seeking an expedited hearing for that. The Minister for the Environment and Order. the government take very seriously their responsibilities under the Act to protect the environment and, in doing so, the interests of all Australians. But as the matter is before the court, it would be inappropriate to comment on this case any further. Senator McKim. Supplementary question. Uh, thank you, President. Minister, given your previous answer and your assertion that 
the minister has appealed Justice Bromberg's recent finding that, in fact, she does owe a duty of care to Australia's children to, to provide them with the same climate. Why does the minister believe that she does not owe Australia's children a duty of care to provide them with a safe climate into the future? Order. Order. Senator, Senator Hume. Uh, thank you, Mr President. In appealing the judge's finding about the impact of greenhouse gas emissions, the minister does not dispute that our climate is in fact changing. The notice of appeal simply raises a point of legal argument. Some of the factual findings that the judge made were not based on the evidence before him. Senator McKim, a final supplementary question. Thank you, President. The uh, appeal papers lodged by the minister, in fact, and I will quote directly from them, argue that Justice Bromberg erred in finding that the minister owed a duty to take reasonable care to avoid causing personal injury or death to per persons under the age of 18 arising from the emissions of carbon dioxide. Given the IPCC report released last night, how can you possibly look Australia's children in the eye and argue that you don't owe them a duty of care? Senator Hume. Possibly look any Australian in the eye and say what happened this morning at Parliament House was not a crime. A crime. Duty of Order. care. That was a crime. Order. And you're defending them, Senator McKim. You're defending Order. them. Senators McKim and Wish Wilson. Senator Wish Wilson, at least pretend to abide by the standing orders rather than act with mock outrage to show contempt for the Senate. This place works when there is a modicum of responsibility in the way we act. Senator Hume, have you concluded your answer? You've concluded your answer. Senator Smith. Thank you very much, Mr. President. My question is to the Minister for Foreign Affairs, Senator Payne. Can the Minister update the Senate on maritime security threats in the Middle East region? The Minister for Foreign Affairs, Senator Payne. Uh, thank you very much, Mr President, and I thank Senator Smith for his, uh, his question. Mr President, the Australian government unequivocally condemns the armed drone attack on the civilian tanker MV Mercer Street in waters off Oman, which has been attributed to Iran. Iran's reckless, unlawful, deliberate and targeted attack on a merchant vessel is a clear violation of international law. Australia offers its sincere condolences to the families and friends of the British and Romanian citizens who were killed in this attack, conducted by a drone that was filled with explosives and deliberately flown into the bridge of the tanker. Iran's denials, denials of responsibility for the attack are not credible, Mr President. The Australian government fully supports calls for this Iranian escalation of attacks on civilian shipping to be addressed by the United Nations. Such attacks are now a lethal risk to all merchant shipping in, international merchant shipping in the region. Iran's deliberate attacks on shipping, whether from limpet mines or drones or any other means, must cease, and those responsible for giving orders and carrying out the attacks must be held to account. That the MV Mercer Street also had connections to Israel makes this act more concerning. Iran's shadow war continuing against the State of Israel breaches every foundational principle of the international community of nations and the key obligations of all member states of the United Nations. It is appropriate for the United Nations to address this conduct and its impact on regional stability and the disruption of peace, Mr President. Senator Smith, a supplementary question. Thank you, Mr President. Can the minister advise the Senate on other threats to regional stability in the Middle East? Senator Payne. Mr President, yesterday, the 9th of August, marked 76 years since the last use of atomic weapons in armed conflict at Nagasaki. The resolve of the international community to prevent the acquisition and use of nuclear weapons has grown year on year. Today, more than ever, the global community insists on compliance with the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty and supports the inspection and verification work of the International Atomic Energy, Authority, Energy Agency. The Australian government calls on Iran to work in good faith with the parties, including to the Joint Comprehensive Plan of Action, to return to compliance with the NPT, to allow complete 
IAEA verification of its peaceful intentions for nuclear technology and to reverse its steps towards weapons-grade nuclear material. Senator Smith, final supplementary question. Thank you, Mr President. Can the minister advise of other concerns in the Middle East? Senator Payne. Mr President, against last week's anniversary of the tragic port ex explosion in Beirut, which we marked here in this chamber, Hezbollah chose to launch a number of rocket attacks into Israel. Israel made proportionate responses, Mr President. Hezbollah's use of, human, of villages as human shields is against international law. And in this regard, the courageous actions of Lebanese civilians to stop one of the Hezbollah mobile rocket launches from escaping is worthy of public recognition. This action resulted in the arrest of the terrorists. Iran's well-documented supply of funds and weapons to terror organisations like the Hamas brigades, Islamic Jihad and others fuels instability and violence, Mr President. And Australia joins international calls for Iran to also cease the abuses of human rights inside Iran, particularly the persecution of religious minorities, including the Baha'i, Sunni Muslims, Christians and Zoroastrians, amongst others. Senator O'Neill. Thank you, Mr President. My question is to the Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Birmingham. Reports indicate that Mr Morrison will pursue freedom incentives, and Mr Morrison has said that Australians who have a vaccine will have vaccine certificates by October this year. Does this minister support vaccine certificates? And does he support these certificates being mandatory for air travel within Australia and overseas? The Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Birmingham. Thanks, uh, thanks Mr President. I thank Senator O'Neill for uh, her question. There's a few things that are relevant to, uh, to that question. It, uh, it is important that, uh, that Australians be in a position to be able to uh, provide a form of proof of vaccination. Uh, the importance of that uh, is likely to be the case for a number of reasons, not just uh, medical reasons. Uh, that's why uh, the government has been working in terms of the technology uh, to enable people to be able to download their vaccine certificate uh, as, uh, as part of their uh, Apple Wallet uh, uh, technology platforms, for example. It's also why work is underway uh, for, um, uh, for uh, high security proof of vaccination uh, linkage to um, uh, passport type documents for international travel. Uh, a number of countries of the world have made it clear already that, uh, that uh, vaccination may be uh, an important part or, uh, or a requirement in relation to entry to their nations in the future, and so Australians uh, will likely need and require that sort of uh, technology and support to be able to, uh, to make uh, a proof of vaccination and demonstrate that as part of their travels and their engagements. Uh, in terms of uh, requirements in relation to vaccination in Australia and for uh, domestic travel, um, uh, airlines themselves, uh, some have indicated that they uh, expect this to be a requirement for, uh, for travel. Uh, those, uh, those are at this stage commercial decisions. Uh, governments have made certain decisions in relation to certain workforces, especially uh, those such as, uh, as aged care sectors where public health orders uh, could be used in relation to uh, vaccination and uh, once again uh, having effective proof of vaccination uh, may well be uh, a relevant consideration for people in those workforce environments or also for those perhaps visiting aged care facilities or the like in the future, uh, which is why having such technology available is important, Mr President. Senator O'Neill, a supplementary question. Uh, thank you, Mr President. Senator Canavan has declared, and I quote, I'm dead set against any vaccine passports. I know many of my Nationals colleagues will not be supporting any kind of rollout of vaccine passports in this country. Does this minister agree with Senator Canavan? Senator Birmingham. Thanks, uh, thanks Mr President. Well, Mr President, uh, I'll let Senator Canavan speak uh, for himself, particularly uh, in relation to the fact that uh, uh, I think you would find there is uh, some distinction between uh, what some may uh, declare vaccine passports to be uh, or some extension that some may make to what they believe vaccine passports could be used for uh, uh, versus what the reality uh, may end up being in terms of uh, how they are applied or used. Uh, I would hope that, uh, that all Australians understand in terms of the way I have explained the likely need 
uh, for technology platforms uh, that can provide proof of vaccination uh, as being uh, a sensible thing for people to have, to be able, as I say, to facilitate uh, their ability uh, to travel internationally in the future and what are likely to be changed circumstances, uh, to be able to work in sectors where there are requirements for uh, vaccination or to be able to meet other uh, potential public health requirements that states or territories uh, may impose uh, to continue to successfully manage COVID-19. Senator O'Neill, a final supplementary question. Thank you, Mr President. When discussing vaccine certificates, Liberal Senator Alex Antic said, and I quote, the Nuremberg Code arises in the ashes of World War II where I suppose there were medical procedures being done on people against their will. And you know, wow. it's a very, very slippery slope that we get into if we start doing this. Does this minister agree with Senator Antic? Wow. Wow. Senator Birmingham. Thanks, um, uh, thanks, Mr. President. Well, Mr. President, uh, I can't say that I'd heard, uh, heard that quote until the senator uh, used it. Order. I, I'm but thank, thank you, Senator O'Neill. Thank you. Uh, I want to emphasise, uh, because the quote suggests perhaps a misunderstanding, that there's going to be some compulsion for people to have uh, a vaccine. The government's always been very clear uh, that, uh, that uh, Australians uh, will face a choice in relation to getting vaccinated. We do urge all Australians to exercise that choice. We urge all Australians to exercise that choice. And Mr President, I'm very pleased that some 234,899 Australians uh, turned out yesterday uh, as part of the vaccination program, uh, pushing the number of people uh, and vaccine doses administered to some 13.958 million uh, people across Australia. And that, Mr President, uh, is a demonstration of the momentum that is building across a rollout that has now seen 44.7 per cent Senator of those Birmingham, aged over 16 receive at least their expired. first dose. Senator Patterson. Thank you, Mr President. My question is for the Minister for International Development and the Pacific, Senator Selger. Can the Minister advise the Senate on how Australia is supporting the economic needs of our partners in the Pacific and Timor-Leste as we chart our way back from the COVID-19 pandemic together? Minister for International Development and the Pacific, Senator Seselja. Uh, well, thank you. Uh, yes, I can. The pandemic continues to have a profound impact on Australia's economy, as it does on our Pacific and Southeast Asian neighbours. Now, economic recovery is a shared challenge, and we must face it together. Australia has continued to be a strong and steadfast partner to nations in our region throughout the pandemic. And all Australians, I think, can be proud uh, of the significant support we are providing to our friends uh, and neighbours. The economies of the Pacific, especially those reliant on tourism, are suffering badly. Australia is committed to supporting our Pacific family and is ready to respond to new challenges as part of our Pacific step up. Now, through our partnerships for recovery, the government has made our highest ever contribution to Pacific development in 2020-21, providing an estimated $1.7 billion to the region. Now, our funding is supporting the twin goals of health and economic recovery in the Pacific. The funding delivers critical financing to the Pacific and Timor-Leste to help mitigate fiscal crises, maintain essential health services, sustain aviation connectivity and protect the most vulnerable people. Our funding is providing direct financial support to Fiji's budget, uh, which is bolstering social protection schemes for those in need. In PNG, we are supporting a new child nutrition grant, the first social protection payment of its type to be introduced. We've also restarted Pacific Labor initiatives to boost economic activity and incomes for Pacific families, as well as to support our farmers and in industries meet critical workforce needs. Australia has also directly facilitated the delivery of over a million vaccine doses, which will reach $1.5 million, $1 million by the end of this week and over 100 tonnes of humanitarian supplies on more than 400 Australian-supported flights. Our commitment and support to the Pacific and Timor-Leste is deep and enduring, and we'll always support our Pacific family in their time of need. Senator Patterson, a supplementary question. Thank you, Mr President. How is Australia working with nations in our region to deliver world-class infrastructure to support long-term economic recovery and grow future prosperity in our region? Senator Selger. 
Well, thank you. Well, through grants and loans provided by the Australian Infrastructure Financing Facility for the Pacific, uh, the Australian government continues to invest in high-quality and transformative infrastructure projects across the Pacific. We're helping Pacific nations to deliver uh, projects that they have identified as priorities for their people, and we are lending on sustainable terms uh, that will not add further debt distress to their budgets. Now, in Palau, uh, we are financing the Palau submarine cable, which will see fast, reliable, high-speed internet <laughs> connecting Palau to the world. The Tina River hydropower and transmission system in the Solomon Islands will deliver large-scale clean energy for Honiara and surrounding communities. And in PNG, I recently announced Australian support for the redevelopment of PNG's major ports and the Transnational Highway, truly nation-building infrastructure which will transform PNG's trade-based economy. Now, with a future AIFFP investment pipeline of over one billion dollars. Australia is more committed than ever Order. to working Senator with Pacific Selger, nations the to support has them in their... Senator Patterson, a final supplementary question. Thank you, Mr President. How is Australian support contributing to economic stability and job creation throughout the Pacific as well as for Australian businesses? Senator Seselja. Well, thank you. Now, supporting the region's economic recovery recovery is critical to Australia's own recovery and to securing jobs both in Australia and across the Pacific. On Pacific Labor programs uh, are high priorities for nations in our region and indeed is one of Australia's highest priorities for the Pacific. Now, Through the Pacific Labor Scheme and the Seasonal Worker Program, we are providing valuable employment opportunities to more than 14,000 Pacific and Timor-Leste workers, which is not just boosting the workers' incomes but helping to stimulate the economies of the region. These workers are meeting the critical workforce needs of hundreds of Australian businesses in a range of sectors, including horticulture, meat processing, tourism and aged care, just to name a few. And As the Prime Minister announced uh, on Friday at the Pacific Island Forum Leaders' Meeting, we will double the number of Pacific workers in Australia between now and March next year. This is all part of our plan to secure the economic recovery and protect jobs both in Australia and across the region. Senator Lambie. Thank you, Mr President. My question is for the Minister representing the Minister for Energy and Emissions Reduction, Ms. Minister Seselja. Senator, it's no secret that I've been sceptical about climate change in the past. I used to think all this stuff about climate change was absolute rubbish. That was only in 2017. Since then, I've listened and I've watched and I've changed my mind. And I think a lot of people like me have changed their minds about climate change too. Because anyone can see that the weather we're getting now is not natural. And that report from the IPCC yesterday should scare the hell out of us. Senator, unless something changes, we're going to hit 1.5 degrees of warming within two decades. It is time for your government to stand up and admit that you were wrong too. Will you admit that we need to tackle, that we need to change tack here and do something very different to stop this from happening or at least slowing it down? The Minister representing the Minister for Energy and Emissions Reduction, Senator Seselja. Uh, well, thank you very much, uh, Mr President. I thank uh, Senator Lambie for her question. Uh, there is no doubt that the Australian government takes the issue of climate change and emissions reductions uh, very seriously, and I'm pleased. I'm pleased that Senator Lambie is uh, is calling for action. But I, I can I can take Senator Lambie and the Senate uh, through some of the measures that we actually are taking, which demonstrate how seriously we take this issue. So uh, when Australia makes commitments to reduce emissions, unlike perhaps uh, some other nations, we take those very seriously and we deliver on those commitments. Uh, it's not just about making a commitment, it is about delivering it. So, uh, for Between 2005 and 2019, we reduced our, between 2020, we reduced our emissions by 20 per cent. Now, we look around the world, there are many countries, uh, many countries in the OECD, uh, in fact the average is about 9 per cent, so we're about double the emissions reductions of advanced economies. If you look at the G20, about half of G20 economies have seen their emissions uh, increase during that period. So we take that very seriously. We take seriously uh, our investment in renewables, which uh, when we see in, in relation to solar is at the highest levels in the world uh, on a per capita basis, much higher on a per capita basis than other countries. And I, I hear the interjections from the Green senators there, always making a constructive contribution on behalf of their activist arm that we saw outside parliament vandalising this place today. But unlike the Greens, uh, unlike the Greens, we actually believe that when you take these measures, you need to do it in an economically responsible way. One of the uh, well, one, well, I do. Well, one of the other areas, one of the other areas we are doing is we are supporting climate resilience in the Pacific. 
We are doing that through significant investments of hundreds of millions of dollars. If we were to take, take the Greens' advice and destroy our economy tomorrow on the altar of uh, their climate goals, we wouldn't Order. be able to support our Pacific partners. So we're doing our bit. We're working with our international partners to lower emissions, to see more investment in renewables, but we'll do it in a way that is sustainable for our economy and jobs Senate as well. Order on my left. Order. Senator Lambie, a supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. President. Swen uh, France and Sweden replace their whole coal fleet with nuclear power, and they now have the lowest per capita carbon emissions in the world. Meanwhile, we've got nearly a third of the world's uranium here, but for some reason, we won't use it ourselves. This government says that we can cut Australia's emissions using technology, not taxes. If you're actually serious about that, will the government consider replacing our coal fired power stations with nuclear power? Senator Seselja. I'm, I'm hearing less hear hears from the Greens for that question uh, in, relation to, uh, in relation to nuclear power. But look, when it comes uh, to that issue, and I thank uh, Senator Lambie for the question, uh, Senator Lambie would be aware that uh, there is a moratorium on nuclear generation in this country, and of course, uh, we believe as a government that any changes to that would require bipartisan support. There's been a blanket anti-nuclear stance from the Labor Party, I think, since the 1970s. So, uh, what we've said in relation to this technology, uh, like all technologies, we are watching uh, developments. Last year, the Morrison government released Australia's technology investment roadmap. In the roadmap, small modular reactors are identified as a watching brief technology. Uh, there is no doubt. Uh, that we, we need to take action uh, in this space. But when it comes to the issue of nuclear, uh, we all know uh, that when you have a blanket ban on one side of politics, and given the long lead times that are needed for this type of investment, uh, we know that there are significant challenges to the ability uh, to look at that type of technology. But when it comes to other moves, uh, we're doing it through renewables, and we're doing it through a technology, not tax taxes approach, which is where Order, we're going to be Senator taking it Selger. into the future. Senator Lambie, a final supplementary question. In 2015, I did a fuel security, and the biggest thing we had was nuclear power, and it was made very clear it would be a 10-year turnaround. We're still sitting here now, six years later, six years later, and the Liberal Party is still on, hasn't even got past the first base of doing anything about nuclear power. So please stop the wishy-washy and can get up and give me an explanation of what you intend to do when we own nearly one third of the world's uranium, and you're still sitting on your butts and not doing anything about nuclear power for this country. Senator Selja. Uh, well, thank you very much, Senator Lambie. I, I, I think I, I largely addressed uh, your second supplementary in the answer to your first supplementary. Uh, so I don't know that there's much I can add, and certainly not much that I could add uh, which, would, which would satisfy your answer. But what I would say is this. Uh, when it comes to taking action uh, on climate change, uh, reducing emissions, uh, we always have to take a very practical real-world approach, and that is what this government uh, has always sought to do. It is taking the issue seriously, but it is also recognising uh, that if we don't work uh, for global action with countries right around the world, uh, if we don't work to support existing industries, if we don't make sure that we have strong uh, baseload power to deliver, uh, then our economy uh, would go backwards. We would see jobs shed, uh, and it would all be for naught uh, if, we are, if we are sacrificing our economy and not actually seeing it move the dial when it comes to the environment. So we take a very responsible approach which balances all of these realities Order, as laid out in the earlier, earlier answers. Billick remotely. Thank you. My question is to the Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Birmingham. The Morrison government has sent more than 11,000 debt notices for $32 million to social welfare recipients who receive JobKeeper. How much of the $13 billion in JobKeeper payments it paid to companies who saw an increase in profit has the Morrison government sought to recover? Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Birmingham. Thanks, uh, thanks Mr. President. I thank, uh, I thank Senator Billick uh, for the question. Uh, Mr. President, uh, it's important as always that, uh, that where uh, programs are operated uh, and claims have been made against the uh, guidelines, conditions, or eligibility of those programs, uh, that steps are made uh, to recover uh, those funds. Uh, that's the case in relation to JobKeeper, like any other program. Uh, and whilst, uh, whilst Senator Billick, you have 
chosen to highlight uh, one component uh, of the recovery activity, and that is uh, in relation to uh, individuals who may have been in receipt uh, of other payments, such as uh, job seeker, uh, whilst also receiving job keeper. Uh, it is also the case uh, that the Australian Taxation Office uh, has been pursuing uh, significant instances uh, of uh, overclaims, overpayments or inappropriate claims uh, with businesses. In fact, as of August, some $296.6 million uh, has been identified uh, by the Australian Taxation Office with Australian businesses, uh, and the government takes very seriously uh, recovering those funds as well. Uh, approximately $185.5 million of those funds has been recovered to date. Uh, so, Mr President, on all of these fronts, what we are assessing against is the eligibility of businesses or individuals to the payments they received according to the guidelines at the time. It shouldn't be confused at all, Mr President, of course, with some of the claims people make uh, about receipt of JobKeeper, which was entirely within the guidelines as they existed at the time. And those programs, that program in particular, has been identified by the Reserve Bank to have saved around 700,000 Australian jobs, uh, Mr President. A crucial program in terms of keeping businesses afloat during a time when right across Australia they were having their doors shut, and in having the doors shut, of course, they were faced with the proposition of having to stand down their staff. JobKeeper avoided that, and it helped to ensure Australians kept their jobs and our economy was in the strongest Order. possible Senator position for recovery. Billick, a supplementary question. Will the Morrison government seek to compulsorily recover a single dollar of the $13 billion of taxpayer money it paid to companies despite them seeing an increase in earnings during the pandemic? Senator Birmingham. Thanks, uh, thanks Mr President. I'm, not, I'm hoping that I heard all of Senator Billick's question uh, correctly there, uh, and because part of the reason why I'm not sure whether I did, because uh, I think I answered Senator Billick's question in the primary question, that in terms of uh, the government seeking to recover funds from Australian businesses. Order, Senator. I have Senator Wong on a point of order. Senator Wong. Point of order. Uh, if I could direct relevance, but perhaps I could assist. Uh, it was compulsory recover. <laughs> Senator Birmingham to continue. So, in terms of uh, in terms of recovering uh, funds from Australian businesses and compulsory recovering funds from any Australian businesses uh, that made inappropriate claims. Uh, the Australian Taxation Office uh, has the power uh, to be able to pursue and to recover funds uh, where necessary. Uh, as always, we use uh, the powers uh, judiciously, uh, be they individuals or businesses, uh, and, where possible, uh, repayment plans are negotiated or agreed uh, between parties. As said in the primary question, some $296.6 million in overpayments have been identified. Many of these were honest mistakes. But nonetheless, $185.5 million has been recovered, and the government will continue to pursue recovery Order, uh, of the residual Senator amount. Birmingham. Senator Billick, a final supplementary question. While it's hounding social welfare recipients for $32 million, the Morrison government is happy to leave $13 billion in the pockets of companies that saw an increase in earnings, and is happy to use $660 million of taxpayers' money for car park rorts like its Liberal Party money. When it comes to spending taxpayers' money, why is it one rule for those struggling on social welfare and another rule for everybody else? Senator Birmingham. Thanks, uh, thanks Mr President. And, uh, and I note Senator Billick uh, saying, uh, why is it one rule for some and another for, uh, for others? Well, I can't help but think, Mr President, you know, why is it the Labor Party pick on some but not others? Uh, why is it, of course, that they're after businesses or they're after religious organisations but they overlooked the millions of dollars that trade unions also received. That they Order. overlooked the millions of dollars that trade unions received. So you know, why is it that they're Order. so selective in terms of who it is that they hate, who it is that they wish to vilify? The simple facts are that Australian businesses were having their doors slammed shut last year right across the country, in every state, in every Order. territory, as lockdowns and shutdowns occur. JobKeeper was born with Order. the simplest of eligibility criteria to seek to make it easy to save those jobs. It worked. It saved 700,000 jobs. We're not going to vilify Order. the businesses who were legitimately able to claim it, but I do note the hypocrisy of those who seem to overlook the trade Order. unions who are happy to Senator take the cash. Birmingham. Order. 
Order. Senator, Senator Van. Thank you, Mr President. My question is to the Minister representing the Minister for Communications, Urban Infrastructure, Cities and the Arts, my fellow Victorian Senator, Senator Hume. Can the Minister advise the Senate how the Liberal and Nationals government is supporting businesses to access cheaper and faster broadband as part of our plan to chart Australia, Australia's way back from the COVID-19 pandemic? Minister representing the Minister for Communications, Urban Infrastructure, Cities and the Arts, Senator Hume. Uh, thank you, Mr President, and I thank Senator Van for the question and for his enduring interest in uh, the connectivity and connection of all Australians to the NBN network. Oh. Mr President, I am extraordinarily pleased to confirm that NBN Co will establish an additional 44 business fibre zones, providing access to ultra-fast business-grade broadband at reduced prices for an additional 60,000 businesses in Australia. Following Order. this announcement, NBN Co will ha now have a network of 284 business fibre zones nat nationally. Senator that will cover 850,000 businesses. Well, no, I'll happily take the interjection. I'll happily take this interjection. Uh, Mr. President, because this government will not be lectured to by those opposite on the NBN. This government has delivered the NBN efficiently and economically when Australians needed it the most. In fact, today there are over 11.97 million premises ready to connect. 99 per cent of Australian premises can now order an NBN service. More than 8.2 million premises have already connected to the NBN, and 75 per cent of homes and businesses are on 50 megabits or higher plans. In fact, following this announcement, the NBN Co will have a network of 284 business fibre zones nationally, covering over 850,000 businesses. Order, now, as Senator well as extending the business fibre zones footprint, NBN Co is further discounting its already competitive wholesale prices for business grade broadband in order to support more business access, uh, dedicated business grade fibre services. New and existing businesses within business fibre zones will benefit from further wholesale pricing reductions of up to 37 per cent. And for a business already within an NBN Co business fibre zone, this morning's announcement means savings of as much as $1,800 each and every Set year. Order. Businesses within those business fibre zones will benefit from access to NBN Co's premium business grade product, um, product enterprise Ethernet at no upfront cost, as well as CBD equivalent pricing, irrespective of where the business is located. Senator Van, a supplementary question. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. Minister, what do NBN Co's promising financial results that were announced today? mean for Australians. Senator Hume. I th th thank you Senator again. Senator thank let you the again, Minister start Mr. before you interject. <laughs> Senator Hume. Thank you again, Mr President. Well, I am extremely pleased to welcome NBN Co's announcements of its strong connection performance and the financial results for the 2020 and 2021 financial year. As I said earlier, there are now nearly 12 million premises ready to connect to the NBN. There have been 930,000 new connections in the year, with a total of 8.2 million premises now connected. Now, this represents around a 13 per cent increase on last year. Revenue has been growing as more households and more businesses are using the NBN for high-speed broadband. And it's ex extremely pleasing to see that 17 per cent of premises have chosen their plans from their retailer that provide download speeds of 100 megabits per second or even higher. The NBN Co is now generating positive operating earnings as me measured by EBITDA, measured by earnings before interest, tax, depreciation and amortisation, and is in fact now $1.35 billion Order, for the Senator year, Hume. which is a turnaround Time of $2 billion. Has expired. From... Senator Van, a final supplementary question. Thank you, Mr President. Minister, how will NBN Co look to further improve the connectivity experience for Australians? Senator Hume. Mr President, Senator NBN Co Arneel. is now entering a new growth phase and is making new investments to provide even better broadband to all Australians. NBN Co is now focused on its $4.5 billion network investment plan to deliver gigabit capacity or capability on demand to 75 per cent of premises in the fixed line network as soon as 2023. In fact, in fact by calendar year end, the company plans to initiate a small volume launch of fibre to the known and fibre to the premise upgrades, making up to, one up to 10,000 premises eligible to access the NBN Co's 
home ultra-fast plans, offering download speeds of up to one gigabit per second. It's forecast at 75 per cent of premises on the fixed line network, or around 8 million premises, will be able to access the highest, the highest speed home ultra-fast services as soon as 2023. Order, Senator Hume. Senator Seward. Thank you, Mr. President. Mr. Mr. President, my question is to the Minister for Government Services, Minister Reynolds. Minister, the government has issued 11,771 people with a debt notice after a review of the income support payments and any job keeper income that they were pay, that were paid to them by their employer. Have people in lockdown in New South Wales, Victoria and recently in Queensland received these debt notices and when did they receive them? The Minister for Government Services, Senator Reynolds. Thank you very much, uh, Mr President, and I thank uh, the Senator for her question. Uh, as those in this chamber know, it is the long-standing principle of Australia's social security system that people should be paid correctly according to their individual circumstances. The process ensures our social security system is sustainable into the future because it means that taxpayers only pay recipients what they're eligible for, no more and no less. It's the responsibility of people rece receiving the job seeker payment or other related social security repayments to report their employment income correctly and accurately to Services Australia. And that includes if they were also receiving job keeper in addition to job seeker. Services Australia communicated widely, including through the agency websites and social media channels to inform customers of their obligation to report job keeper income as income and how it, could be impact, how it could impact the remainder of their income support. Around 79,000 individuals were identified as being at risk of incurring an overpayment uh, as they were declaring minimal income and were contacted by Australia, Services Australia from July last year, that is 2020. When a person is overpaid, my agencies will always write to them to let them know how much they were overpaid Order. and Senator explain Reynolds, why they Senator owe the money. Seward on um, order. This, Senator O'Neill, Senator Seward, on a point of order. Point, point of order. I did specifically ask about the number of people in lockdown in, that have received debt notices, and I appreciate the minister's additional information, but I particularly want to know about that. You've reminded the minister of that part of the question. I have been listening carefully, and until this point, I, I do consider the information to be pr being provided to be directly relevant to the subject of the question. You have reminded the minister, though, of, your, of, your, of that part of the question. I call the minister to continue. Uh, thank you very much, Mr President. And in this case, given the complexity and the importance of this issue, I think that the context uh, is vitally important. So if someone was in receipt of both JobKeeper payment and an income support payment, they needed to report the JobKeeper payment amount like any other employment income, and this was always very clear to recipients. Um, under, under job, so just make it very clear also that no individual has had to pay back JobKeeper, whereas um, Senator Birmingham has already uh, clarified uh, that 296 uh, million has been identified as being overpaid to businesses. Order, Senator Reynolds. Senator Seward, supplementary question. Thank you. Um, I still don't know how many people in lockdown have these notices. Um, did, you, did the government give any consideration to the fact that people who receive these payments may now be unemployed and continue to be experiencing financial distress? Senator Reynolds. Look, thank you very much, Mr. President, and. Um, I presume what you're talking about is last year during uh, JobKeeper when that was active, because obviously we have a, a improved the system of payments from the COVID disaster payment process. But as at the 30th of April, if that is the case, uh, Senator Seward, as of the 30th of April this year, 11,771 customers had a debt raised after completion of their JobKeeper compliance review which totals around $32.8 million, and this work is uh, ongoing. Uh, and as always, uh, if uh, clients are in financial distress or uh, have other problems, they can always talk to Services Australia to seek some relief. Senator Seward, a final supplementary question. The government claims that both Job Seeker and Job Keeper programs have strong compliance frameworks, yet you have gone after those on income support as per usual and let 
billionaires like Jerry Harvey off the hook. When will you issue billionaires like Jerry Harvey with debt notices? Senator Reynolds. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. President. And can I just completely reject the premise of that question? And uh, it's been very interesting. Labor have been deliberately conflating the repayment of job keeper payments uh, that were due back from businesses in terms of compliance activities and individuals. So the fact is, as I've just said, $296 million has been identified in overpayments to businesses, and $185 million has been recovered from businesses so far. And while I'm at it, you might like to also ask Labor, and, uh, and in, because unions, unions receive $22 million worth of JobKeeper, and I bet you not a single cent of that has been repaid. And in fact, $7.4 million of the union's JobKeeper money went straight to the Labor Party. So how about asking them about the unions and their payments that they would have received from JobKeeper payments themselves? Senator Birmingham. Thanks, uh, thanks, thanks, Mr. President. Mr. President, uh, I ask that further questions be placed on notice, but I, I do acknowledge the last question came from Senator Seward, who had a notable announcement today. I know we will all have an appropriate time to uh, farewell Senator Seward. In the meantime, no doubt she'll keep holding us all to account too. I understand um, Senator Colbeck would like to add to an answer. Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, I took, undertook to provide some more information on Moderna in response to Senator Gallagher's question. The Moderna deal was announced on the 13th of May following the completion of negotiations with Moderna. Once the TGA received the regulatory submission from Moderna, the TGA then took 23 days to review and approve it. Mr. President, the Australian government has secured 25 million doses of the Moderna COVID-19 vaccine to further diversify our vaccine portfolio, as well as provide access to a booster variant vaccine, should this be required in the future. Thank you, Mr. President. I thank you, Deputy President. Thank you, Minister Colbeck. So we'll now move to taking note. Are there any uh, motions to take note of answers? Uh, Senator McAllister. Thanks very much, Madam Deputy President. And I rise to take note of the answers given by Senator Birmingham to the questions yeah, yeah. asked by uh, Senator Just a Bill. moment, as Senator McAllister, I'll get uh, Senator Gallagher to move that we take note. Ah, oh, thank you. Um, of buttons. Um, thank you. Do you have anything? I move that the Senate take notes of questions asked by Labor. Um, Senator Billick to Senator Birmingham. Thank you. Thank you. Please continue, Senator McAllister. Well, thank you, Deputy President. Earlier this year, we found out that 13 billion in job people went to firms that increased their turnover during the pandemic. It went to Monaco-based billionaires. It went to men's-only clubs. It went to the highest fee private schools in the country. It is a shocking amount of waste. 13 billion is more than the government spent on the childcare subsidy last year. It is more than the government spent on public schools last year. JobKeeper was supposed to go to the firms that were suffering to support the connection between those firms and their workforces. It was never meant to go to highly profitable firms. And like so many things offered by this government, it's a good idea implemented very badly. And just reflect on what it would have meant had the Morrison government avoided this waste. It could have afforded to extend JobKeeper to the one million casual workers who missed out on any support. It could have saved additional people from losing their jobs and their livelihoods during the first wave of the pandemic. And now, now we would have more to spend on supporting Australians that are currently affected by lockdowns and struggling to pay the rent and put food on the table. The Prime Minister has never asked any of these recipients to pay back a single cent. He has said that calls to pay it back are the politics of envy. And Minister Birmingham has said that we shouldn't shame and vilify the businesses who took billions in JobKeeper while turning profit. The Morrison government continues to resist Labor's calls for transparency and for accountability. They refuse to crack down on businesses that won't turn back payments despite turning monster profits. 
It's a strong contrast with what's been reported today. 11,000 people who receive income support payments have been sent debt notices of almost 33 million. And many of these are vulnerable people, people who su sought support during the worst health and economic crisis Australia has faced in nearly 100 years. And these people shouldn't be punished. There's two stories, two stories, aren't there? There's one story for the rich and powerful, and there's another story for those that aren't. But it's very on brand for this government. This is the government, of course, that set up the robo-debt scheme, and it's worth reflecting on what the federal court thought about the impact of that scheme on those who suffered under it. Justice Murphy said one thing stands out, the financial hardship, anxiety and distress, including suicidal ideation, and in some cases suicide, that people or their loved ones say was suffered as a result of the robo-debt scheme, and that many say they felt shame and hurt at being wrongly branded welfare cheats. That's what he said. And the double standard is quite breathtaking. No effort, no effort spared to claw back money paid to some of our most vulnerable. No effort at all expended on clawing back money from big business. Indeed, the government actually seems pretty relaxed about handing out money to billionaire shareholders and CEOs, just as long as nobody knows about it. Transparency is actually not a radical solution or an idea, is it? Both the New Zealand and the US governments keep public databases of companies that receive income support. But the Morrison government is so opposed to transparency that it made it clear yesterday that if the uh, opposition and crossbench insisted on transparency provisions, they were willing to delay the JobKeeper legislation that was debated yesterday. And it really says something about this government. It says something about the Prime Minister that he is prepared to let the livelihoods of Australians on COVID support payments be collateral damage in his fight against transparency. And that's an outcome Labor didn't want to risk. But we strongly believe that the public deserves to know how its money is being spent. Transparency is a basic obligation, never more important than in a time when we need our citizens to have trust in our government. And that is why we will keep looking for opportunities to force the Morrison government to reveal just how much JobKeeper money went to firms that actually increased their turnover during the pandemic, because Australian voters deserve to know. Thank you, Senator McAllister. Senator Rennick. Thank you, Madam Deputy President. Uh, and I seem to recall uh, it wasn't all that long ago uh, we had Labor actually uh, condoning uh, the robo-debt scheme. Uh, they themselves were the ones that brought back in uh, the averaging scheme under the Paul Keating government in the late 80s. Uh, and I'll quote from uh, the member for Sydney, Tanya Plibersek, is it member for Sydney, uh, who said, uh, um, the people who fail to come to this arrangement should settle their debts. Um, there was also the quote uh, from uh, uh, Bill, uh, member. F oh, this was this was uh, member for Sydney. If people fail to come to an arrangement to settle their debts. The government has a responsibility to taxpayers to recover that money. Um, and you know. This is also uh, from the former uh, Deputy uh, Opposition Leader. The automation of this process will free up resources and result in more people uh, being referred to the tax garnishee process, retrieving more outstanding debt on behalf of the taxpayers. And from the member from Maribong, uh, Maribong, sorry, apologies, I don't know how to pronounce that wrong. It is important, it, it is important that the government explores different means of debt recovery to ensure that those who have received more money than they are entitled to repay their debt. And uh, the, uh, Chris Bowen, what's his name? I'm not sure. Apologies for that. Um, McMahon. Uh, he's also called for an apology, uh, sorry, a refund of uh, uh, money uh, collect, you know, overpayments 
uh, through the robo debt scheme. Now, no one's um, saying that the scheme was perfect and that we haven't made mistakes. We vote up to that. Um, but you know, we will never apologise for trying to automate uh, you know, processes in, in terms of tax and transfer system in this country. But when it comes to talking about uh, subsidies for the rich, uh, I think Labor should take a good look in the mirror themselves, because we, we just, uh, as, as uh, the Treasurer pointed out yesterday, uh, the unions themselves received $22 million uh, in JobKeeper fees. Now, uh, given the enormous billions of dollars, the, the billions of dollars they collect uh, every year from superannuation fees, uh, they themselves are the last people who need handouts in a time of a crisis. And let's be honest, I mean, the union industry really today is nothing more than the finance brokering arm of the industry super funds. You have to ask yourself why they aren't being taxed. Now, I know Labor love to complain about, you know, the, the coalition loves to give tax breaks to big business, but if there was a big business in this country, it's the industry super funds. It's the industry super funds and their uh, uh, brokerage, brokerage arm, the, union, uh, the unions themselves. And when you look at the amount of uh, money these guys, the unions collect uh, by threatening to go on strike with these tier one builders. I mean, in Queensland, you know, they threaten to go on strike if it gets hotter than 30 degrees, uh, which is a bit of a joke, really, because you know, anyone knows after September in, in Queensland, it's 30 degrees quite often. So I'm not quite sure when we expect to build anything, get anything built in Queensland. Uh, so good luck on, on, with the Olympic Games for that. Uh, and of course, the other one is the great big renewable energy subsidies uh, that also go to the big end of town. I mean, we've got ten Senator billion Rennick, dollars. Uh, Senator Rennick, I have been listening carefully, and you have drifted yeah. off the taking note response. And I'm listening carefully for a segue back, and I haven't heard it yet. I'm, I'm segueing back to the to the notion that you know, basically, I know uh, Senator McAllister was implying that we we're always giving tax breaks to the big end of town and we were looking after the big end of town. And I'm merely pointing out, Madam Deputy Chair, that you know, Labor should look in the mirror. Labor should look in the mirror and look at how they look after the big end of town. Uh, and you know, as I was pointing out, whether it be the unions or whether it be super funds or whether it be you know, large corporations that get generous subsidies for energy, and, I, and, I, and I'm agnostic here, I don't think any energy company uh, should be getting um, government subsidies. Uh, I know, you know, what, one of the big myths is that somehow uh, our agricultural industry and our fishing industry and our timber industry and our mining industry get free uh, diesel subsidy uh, subsidies. That's not true. They're actually rebates. Um, I.e., they've paid the money and they're getting back what they Senator paid. Rennett, so it's neutral. You do need to uh, get back. To okay, the so I'm coming back response. to robo debt. And can I say that technology? albeit flawed, and I've worked on many uh, IT projects myself, and I can tell you, you can always take the cost of an IT project, double it and times it by three, because that's how much it'll end up costing. Um, but look, you know, I, I'm, I'm happy to take on board. I, I would love to actually look at that robo-debt stuff myself, because having come from a, a systems implementation program, uh, I'm sure there's ways we could fix the system, but you know, we were trying to do the right Thank thing. Thank you, Senator Rennick. Your time has now expired. Um, Senator Brown. Yeah, thank you, uh, Deputy President. Um, I'm always interested to, uh, listening to the coalition talk about robo debt. They never talk about the fact that they had to say sorry. They never talk about the fact that there was a $1.8 billion awarded to the people, to nearly 500,000 people, victims of their robo debt scheme. They never talk about the fact that the judge said it was shameful and unlawful. They never talk about any of that. They try to blame the Labor Party. When, of course, this was a scheme designed by the Morrison government. And what is happening now and what happened in question time today, what we got was responses relating to the job JobKeeper was the rank hypocrisy of the government when it comes to enforcement and compliance measures applied against those that are most vulnerable. And the interesting thing was Senator Birmingham's response. He tried to throw back to the Labor Party, you look you just look after those that can't look after themselves, the more vulnerable. Yes, we do. I mean seriously, it is quite clear in the responses that we got 
that there are two standards here. One for big corporations that have done well from this pandemic. Now, JobKeeper was good for people that were the prop where they were losing their profits. I know that. I know two people that um, received JobKeeper, two companies to, that received JobKeeper. You, know, you can have a, a little chuckle behind your mask over there, Senator, but, that, but they had to show that they were going backwards in profit by about, oh, from memory, about 30 per cent. So this is really interesting when you talk about the guidelines here. So we've got one, one uh, standard for big corporations that have done well and another for ordinary Australians struggling through the repeated lockdowns and border closures, trying to make ends meet, trying to put food on the table. It's, it's just a form of uh, hypocrisy that we really have come to expect from the Morrison Liberal government. <clears throat> One rule for the rich and powerful, you know, where you get off scot-free with taxpayer, um, taxpayer support and when businesses have never been better, and another for the working people of Australia who have just tried to do the right thing, faced with some of the most difficult circumstances Australians have experienced in generations. Because as we've seen highlighted in this place, this is a government more than comfortable, indeed from what it appears overly eager to send more than 11,000 debt notices to welfare recipients who receive JobKeeper while simultaneously handing out an astonishing $13 billion in JobKeeper payments to companies that actually increase their earnings. This is what we're talking about. We're talking about companies that made increase their profits. That's what we're talking about. They didn't need the JobKeeper. They in increased their profits during the pandemic. Just think about, just think about that. And I really ask the senators on the other side to just think about that. $13 billion to line the pockets of businesses who didn't need the support. Meanwhile, there were hundreds and thousands, most probably millions of Australians out there, who had their income smashed it, in desperate need of support, a great many of whom this government has ignored. Think about all the Australians who work in the gig sector, struggling, ignored by the Morrison Liberal government, why their industry was shuttered. In many, if not most parts of the country, it's shuttered again while the rest of the nation has to deal with cancelled shows, gigs, and entertainment and sporting events that ordinarily employ hundreds of thousands of Australians, where is the support for these workers in our creative and arts industries? What about our academics and other university sector workers? Denied JobKeeper. Tens of thousands put out of work because of the decisions made by this government, decisions by, made by Mr Scott Morrison a Prime Minister who turns the other cheek when millions of Australians need support because you know he doesn't hold a hose, not his problem, but when it comes to corporate welfare for the most successful firms in the nation, hello, here's a cool 13 billion in cold hard cash. No questions asked, take it. Thank you, Senator um, Brown. Your time has expired. Senator McMahon. Thank you, um, Madam Deputy President. Um, I would, I would like to respond um, to senators that have um, taken note of answers to the question uh, from Senator Billick to Senator Birmingham. Um, I must admit I am a little bit confused, perplexed, having conniptions even. Um, when we first talked about JobKeeper, when the Prime Minister first announced JobKeeper, those on the other side canned it. It'll never work. What a stupid idea. Um, it turns out that they were wrong. Uh, in fact, they were more than wrong. Uh, this was a, a revolutionary scheme. Uh, it hadn't been done anywhere around the world on the scale that it was proposed to be done here. And it turns out it was a wonderful scheme that saved many, many jobs and many, many businesses. Um, let's face it, we all understand, well at least those of us on this side understand that uh, the vast majority of Australians that are employed in private enterprise are employed in small to medium businesses. 
So there's literally no point in saving jobs. I mean, you can sit someone down in the corner and you can pay them money to keep training for their job, but if they're not working for a business, that, that job doesn't exist. You can, you can save them and you can keep paying them and keep them ready to work, but if in the meantime, all of those businesses that employ those workers cease to exist, then, then you've got nothing for them to come back to. So despite the criticism from Labor, JobKeeper was a very, very good thing that this government brought in. And I'm constantly told by businesses in the Northern Territory as I travel around, thank you, it was JobKeeper that saved us. We would not be here today if it weren't for JobKeeper. Now, of course, on this side of the chamber, we seem to have not gotten the crystal ball that those on the other side have because they seem to be able to look into it and predict what's going to happen. The, there, was, there was doom and gloom at the start. The whole country was locked down. There were predictions of huge levels of unemployment, huge levels of unemployment. We thought many people would be unemployed, many businesses would go under, and uh, we would have no economy left uh, when we finally got on top of the pandemic. Now, fortunately, and, and we felt this on, on this side as well. We thought that, that this was going to be a tragedy. We had to stop in and do something to stop that from happening. And we did this. We stood up and we got in with JobKeeper, saving those businesses. Now, we couldn't predict how the pandemic would go and how the economy would respond. And some quite amazing things happened that we certainly didn't predict, that nobody predicted. I, I was amazed um, in the Northern Territory at the time of the first lockdown. Fortunately, we've only had one tiny one since. We're very lucky. But um, <clears throat> going around and talking to business and seeing how business innovated and managed to get through, and businesses that, in fact, thrived in the lockdown. I, I remember speaking to one particular business in Tennant Creek who thought that um, it was a, a family-run business and he thought that they were going to go under. But it turns out they became incredibly busy because they had a few different businesses, but one of them was supplying skip bins. Now, who would have thought that a pandemic would create a demand for skip bins? And yet it did, because everyone was cleaning out their homes and yards, needed to dispose of it. So this business boomed. And many other businesses boomed, and many recovered and are doing really well. Now, they're penalising us, or trying to penalise us and criticise us for the fact that we did something that helped business not only survive, but thrive. And we now have an obligation to taxpayers to recover money that was paid either accidentally or in some cases claimed deliberately when it shouldn't have been paid. There is nothing wrong with that. And we are not targeting poor people. This is across the board to anybody who received payments that they were not entitled to. There is nothing wrong with recovering funds on behalf of taxpayers. Thank you, Senator McMahon. Your time has expired. Senator Ayres. Thanks, um, uh, Madam Deputy President. Well, Senator McMahon said at the commencement of her remarks that she was confused. Uh, that was the strongest part of her contribution. And nothing that she said over the succeeding five minutes did anything to undermine the perspicacity of that original remark. I think, in fact, the government itself is willfully confused, is absolutely determined to put its own interest uh, and the interest of its mates ahead of the interests of the people in Australia who they should be actually looking after. We are in the depths of a social and public health and economic crisis. More than half of the country in lockdown, in some parts of the country, like Sydney here, with no end in sight because of the government's failure on vaccines. And in the middle of this crisis, when people are uncertain about their jobs and household incomes, fearful for the future, the Morrison government decided to issue 11,771 
of our most vulnerable Australians, the people least secure in this COVID crisis with debt notices because of JobKeeper. Notices for amounts of money that may be nothing to the people who sit on the government side of the chamber, a few hundred dollars here, a few thousand dollars there, but those notices will strike absolute fear into families right across the country. Uh, and it's the hypocrisy. I may well be in Sydney and not in Canberra with you today, but you can smell the hypocrisy from here. You can see the absolute misallocation of priorities, and you can see the absolute willful determination of this government to look after itself and its mates rather than the interest of ordinary Australians. Contrast the approach of the government in terms of compliance uh, and protecting and, and, and going after welfare recipients with its approach on two other issues. Previous senators have pointed out uh, that in terms of the government's approach to corporate recipients of JobKeeper, uh, that there's an entirely different approach. One company, Harvey Norman, received $22 million. It recorded a $462 million profit. Half of that on the back of taxpayer receipts. Uh, Mr Harvey alone re received $78 million. 30 ASX companies recorded higher profits and received hundreds of millions of dollars in JobKeeper allowances. A complete misallocation of resources and priorities. Uh, problems that were easy to foresee. Contrast it with the government's approach to how it approaches public money when it's looking at its own interest. Every week, there is another rort scheme. It was sports rorts, over $100 million, where public money was misdirected away from the interests of community sports clubs to the Morrison government's own re-election prospects. Community development rorts, hundreds of millions of dollars allocated in an entirely partisan way. Regional rorts, hundreds of millions of dollars allocated in an intensely partisan way for the government's own narrow political priorities. Infrastructure rorts. And of course, this week, we discover car park rorts, where the government's allocated money in an entirely partisan way ignored all of the recommendations of the department to allocate money to marginal electorates, some of whom didn't even have a railway station adjacent to the car park that they were building, and allocated in an entirely political way. Well, there's no interest in accountability for hundreds of millions of dollars, billions of dollars misused for the Morrison government's narrow partisan interest, no interest in public accountability and recovering billions of dollars that's been shoveled out the door, uh, not to achieve its purpose of protecting people's jobs, but as lifted corporate profits uh, and lifted shareholder uh, dividends and lifted executive salaries and produced zero jobs in the process. This government has entirely lost its way, lost its capacity to act in the public interest, it's got no interest in that accountability. It just wants to put pressure on ordinary Australians Thank who you, are the Senator most vulnerable. Ayers, your time has expired. So the question is that the motion is moved by Senator Gallagher be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against, I believe the ayes have it. Senator Hanson Young. Acting Deputy President, I rise to take note of the answers given to uh, Senator McKim. Uh, from Senator Hume, representing the Environment Minister. Senator McKim was asking the very important question. Does the Environment Minister of Australia have a duty of care to our nation's children? And the reason this is an important question is because right now we are confronted with some of the most damning and serious scientific facts that humanity has ever seen. We are facing catastrophic climate change, catastrophic weather events and a threat to the whole of humanity. And yet what we see from this government is a response that is glib, that is full of spin 
and that is more of the marketing regimes of madmen than it is of a responsible government. And while this is unfolding, we have right on foot an appeal to the Federal Court of Australia of our own Environment Minister to deny that as a minister of the Crown that she owes a duty of care to Australia's children for the impacts of global warming and climate catastrophe. Last night, the UN's IPCC handed down a very chilling summary of what our world faces if we do not act. It is crystal clear that this is the decade that we need drastic action to cut carbon pollution if we are to give our planet and humanity a fighting chance. And I think about the responsibilities as adults in this place, as parents, as politicians, as leaders, to not just the next generation, but to today's young people. When we are facing a cliff that if we go over, it's going to be very, very difficult, in fact, near impossible to return. We have to get out of fossil fuels. We have to end the expansion of coal, oil and gas, and we have to transition faster than ever to renewables and clean energy sources if we are to get our climate back on track. We need to be investing in our environment and, bi and biodiversity to help Mother Nature repair herself. And all the while, we have the Prime Minister spinning and spinning and spinning, pretending that he is doing everything in his power, gaslighting the entire nation, undermining the health and the safety of our children, putting at risk our economy and our trade relations across the globe. Who is the Prime Minister trying to fool? The climate is reacting because it is in trouble. The environment is in collapse because we are polluting it. Our children are demanding action because they have been taught science, understand it and want better from our political leaders. The marketing and the spin is not going to get us out of this crisis. What we need is deep cuts to carbon pollution, and we need them now. Current policies have us on track for a four degrees warming of our planet. That is a catastrophe. We are running out of time. If we don't turn this ship around, we will face even more severe bushfires, right. more severe flood events, more severe weather, famine, drought, disease. That is why we owe our children a duty of care, because we have been warned. We can't pretend we don't know. And having a nice pithy line in a press conference from the leader of the nation does nothing to help reduce the pollution and to put our climate back on track. Australia needs to get with the program. Our Prime Minister needs to read the science. His government needs to stop the denial and stop the delay, and, owe our, and they owe our children Order. a duty of Senator care. Senator Hanson-Young. The question is the motion moved by Senator Hanson-Young be agreed to. Does that opinion say aye? To the contrary, no. The ayes.